Hello and welcome to the April edition of the Unbiased Science Petri Dish. So if you're not familiar, the Petri Dish is a monthly Q&A that we open up to our paid Substack subscribers. So for just $5 a month, um, you get access to a private Facebook group that gets you direct access to Andrea and myself. Um, and we also ask you to submit questions that we answer here. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. We got a bunch of questions, so many that we probably can only answer a handful, but then we'll make sure to, to get all these questions answered at some point or another. Um, and the other really cool thing about Substack is it's sort of a nice way of saying thank you <laughs> to us for, you know, um, running this page and, and the podcast. And it helps us cover um, some of the overhead costs, the operational costs of, um, you know, of recording, producing, disseminating the podcast and um, and our infographics. So thank you to, to, to those who have subscribed. And if you haven't already, um, you can check us out. Andrew, do you happen to know offhand, sorry, I'm totally putting you on the spot, what it is? Yeah, the, website um, it's the unbiased sidepod.substack.com and the only reason i remember that is because i have to repeat it every single week <laughs> on the podcast i was hoping that was the case but i'm like oh crap if she doesn't know it i'll just google it really quickly um and it's also on our website and linked in our instagram bio so um so thank you all right, without further ado, um, we pulled six questions to answer, and we want to give a special shout out to, um, oh my gosh, Andrea, this is terrible that I don't know her name offhand. It was um, Marusa, who actually, I believe that that's her name, and I'm sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who actually made this amazing, who gave us this idea to record our responses in this way, and then not only to share it with our Substack subscribers, but to share it with the with the public. Yeah. Um, so that was really awesome. And we did get your question, and it, it's just, it's an involved question, so you actually inspired us. We're going to dedicate an entire podcast episode to answering your questions. Question. Andrea, do you remember um, her question offhand? I think it had to do with creatinine or... Um, uh, creatine supplements. Creatine, creatinine. Hello. Creatine supplements. Okay. Can, can I just disclose that literally just about 10 minutes ago, I pick my head up out of my pillow. I've, I've been having a migraine today. So um, apologies if my brain is a little bit fuzzy, but Andrea and I, we just, we make it work. Right, Andrea? <laughs> um, all right. So let's get into it. So the first question that we're going to answer today came from D from Portland, who asked, does drinking a large glass of ice cold water first thing in the morning boost your metabolism or does it have any benefits at all? So we've seen this. This is something that, I mean, we see all the time. It's gone viral on TikTok. People basically saying that the very first thing that you should do in the morning is have an ice cold glass of water. And then there are some variations of this where you can squeeze lemon in there, which, which also has um, some other touted benefits. But, yeah. but this per, per particular um, uh, practice, it's, it's all about how the, the temperature of the water boosts our metabolism. So this is an example of, you know, there, there's a seed of truth, but this isn't going to be life changing, right? So um, there have been a few studies. Most recently, there was a study out of the University of Washington that found that, yes, the temperature of water does make some difference and, and drinking cold water will increase metabolism, but so slightly. So according to the study, when you drink a cup of ice water, you burn about eight more calories than when you drink room temperature water. And this is because the body works to increase the temperature of the ice water to our body temperature. But the thing is, and Andrea, I know we were commiserating about this, is that it's such a minuscule dent in the calorie balance that it's not going to be this panacea. It's not really going to help you lose weight um, if you're eating the same and, you know, have the same exercise pattern, if those things aren't changing. And and I think it's really important that, like, when people say things like boost your metabolism, like, metabolism is thousands of different bio biophysical, biochemical, biological pathways. Like, you're not, again, 
boosting anything. We're talking here about the basal metabolic rate, which is how many calories you burn per hour. Um, and, and the specific heat of water is quite high, so it, it does take a little bit more energy to warm the temperature of the water. But in the grand scheme of things, yeah, it's not... If you like if you like ice cold water, cool. If you like room temperature water, that's great too. Um, drinking water first thing in the morning is good to rehydrate because you have not drank water for presumably eight hours, um, and you know a lot of people don't drink enough water to begin with. But it's not, you know, again, it's not flushing toxins. It's not doing all these other things that people claim to be. So again, if you if you like ice cold water, which I I prefer very cold water over room temperature water. Um, but I have some friends who you know it it bothers their teeth and they drink room temperature and so go with that right i was just gonna say i love ice cold water yeah. specifically the colder, with the crushed ice the <laughs> yeah. colder the better um and so that helps me drink more so in that way it's definitely beneficial but again in terms of burning calories yes it looks like you know drinking ice cold water there's something some truth to that but it's nothing incredibly meaningful that's going to change your life and actually andrea a really quick question as a runner uh, with hydration, do you, is there, like, do you prefer room temp? Like, do you keep ice water with you? Like, does that? Yeah, so, so when I'm doing my really long runs, I wear a hydration vest, which has a two liter right. water bladder. And especially in the summer, I do put ice in it when I fill it, but that melts, you know, within a period of time. So it starts out cold and it gets progressively warmer. And, and at that point you just drink what you got because you're so thirsty. Right. Does it impede your ability to drink quickly or do you maybe not want to drink super quickly? I, I don't know. I cold? just have all these questions. Yeah. Like if it's ice cold, does it make it no, harder to... I I love it. So, okay. you know, the, the tubing is skinny enough that the ice itself isn't going and it's just the temperature of the water. But um, sometimes, like, the sloshing can bother people. So there's some tricks to, like, make sure that there there isn't, like, an air bubble in the bladder and, you know. But, yeah, we, uh, we, fi we figure out ways. Actually, there's a couple of running routes that we run in the summer for some of the really long runs that are nearby. Um, my, my Pennsylvania folks will know nearby Wawa's and you can – go in and refill with ice water at the, you know, the fountains and stuff. So, um, we you try love your Wawa's. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Wawa. Going off topic. And actually for folks who haven't attended our Petri dishes in the past, these are a little bit more playful. We're kind of letting our hair down, so to speak. So pardon, pardon the silliness. If you're not used to this, it's a little different than the tone that we strike in our podcast episodes. It's meant to be a little bit more playful and informal. All right. Can we go to our next question, which I loved because this is something that I do all the time. So this question came from Jared from Louisiana, who asked, is cracking your knuckles and your neck bad for you? I am a knuckle cracker. Are you a knuckle cracker? Oh, all the time. I also crack my neck all the time. Like, if I do that, I can crack my neck usually. It's, Mul it's just... Multiple times a day. I have scoliosis, so, like, for me, it, like, it feels good temporarily how am i just now finding out that you had scoliosis Andrew? Yeah, yeah. i don't know if you can see but this shoulder is like ob like distinct distinctly lower than this one i mean i would never have noticed if you didn't mention that that's so interesting yeah. so we both crack our knuckles i get such pleasure it's you sort of it right like now. a yeah and i do do you ever do this the thumb? I do the thumb mm. sometimes too. And I crack oh, my and I the crack back. my toes after a long run. Mm. Toes are a good one. <laughs> Love that. So for those who don't know, the noise of cracking or popping um in our joints, it's actually nitrogen bubbles bursting in our synovial fluid. Am I saying that right? Synovial. Yes. Um so synovial fluid lubricates our joints, reducing friction and preserving our cartilage. And it takes about 20 minutes for the nitrogen bubbles in the synovial fluid to reform and that's when you can crack again and that that totally checks out because I do it and then you know I can't crack again I have yep. to wait about 20 minutes um so uh what was I gonna say 
So, um, part of the part of the appeal of knuckle cracking could be for some people that twenty minute lull when those gas bubbles are re reforming. Um, some people say that they feel looser during that period. Some people say that they feel like pressure has been relieved. For me, again, it's just sort of a habit I formed. I've been doing yeah. it for decades. Mine's so. like mine's a bit of a compulsion. And I remember when I was a little kid because I did judo, and so you're grabbing people and you're throwing them, and finger muscles are you know really important and um you know decades ago it was all like oh well cracking your knuckles is gonna cause arthritis and you know it, yes <laughs> that's what and, i heard too yeah, yeah i mean it's just a complete fallacy so arthritis happens when when the joint the joint itself becomes inflamed and that's typically because you've got this cartilage which is you know um um, connective tissue it's like a soft material that's kind of covering the bones at the at each joint and then you have the synovial fluid in between and eventually that cartilage in certain people can wear down um, then you have bone rubbing on bone which is leading to friction and that can lead to inflammation and swelling and that's what's actually causing your arthritis but but cracking your knuckles isn't damaging the cartilage it's not damaging the synovial fluid it's just moving the bubbles around um so it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's it, harmless. Yeah. I mean, unless you're experiencing pain and then that might be indicative of some other issue, but the knuckle cracking itself isn't causing arthritis or any of yes. these problems. The caveat would be when you're talking about cracking your neck, cracking your back, things like that, because now you're dealing with your spinal column. And so as we've talked about with the chiropractic episode, there are potential, you know, neurological harms that might be done if, you know, a nerve gets imp gets impinged. And so, you know, finger knuckles, probably relatively harmless when you're talking about your neck or your back. Just, you know, exert some caution. Love that. Love that. So crack away. Hmm. All right, Andrea, our next question. I don't see who it came from, but do you want to yeah, jump in? So I, I don't know... Maybe they submitted anonymously, which is Might fine. Might have been. Might have been. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, this person wanted to know about blood donations. So, set the stage. Um, she typically goes to donate whole blood, a whole blood unit. And um, her husband typically goes also with her for a whole blood donation. But she wasn't able to donate. She had low iron on that day. And he did a power red donation, which basically means that he's giving double the, the amount of red cells. And so she was a little bit skeeved out because the power red basically, and I'll maybe I'll describe them in a second, but the power red, you actually don't take all of the blood components. You actually recycle and send some of the blood fluids back. And so there's a tubing and you see this yellow fluid that's going back into the person's vein. And so she was like, well, it looks like beer and it was kind of gross, but I know it's probably not gross. Um, so I wanted to kind of, you know, understand what's going on so I don't feel as uncomfortable and I would make maybe do a power red donation in the future. So whole blood is technically, you know, an organ um, and it contains a whole lot of things. So whole blood has everything in blood as, you know, as you would imagine, it has red blood cells, which we call erythrocytes. It has white blood cells, which are our immune cells. And there's a lot of different populations of those. And we call those leukocytes. Um, and then, then we have platelets, which are they're not really cells, but they were derived from cells. And they're this weird nuclei-free small objects that participate in blood clotting. Um, and then we have plasma. And plasma is the liquid component of blood. It makes up about 55% of blood volume. Um, it doesn't have cells in it, but it is yellowish in color. So that's your beer-colored liquid. And it's filled with proteins. So um, a lot of different proteins, um, cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, you know, all of the things that feed all the cells in blood. So when you're doing a standard donation, that's a whole blood donation. And all they're doing is they're doing an intravenous retrieval of one pint of whole blood. And, um, and with that, you can donate every eight weeks. And the reason for that time difference or that, that period is because your red cells take a little bit of time to regenerate. And red blood cells um, transport oxygen, which also bind iron. And so sometimes after a blood donation, because you've given away a, a pint of blood, which is not going to be harmful, but you may feel more fatigued because now you just have fewer red blood cells um, for a period of time. A power red donation is basically 
you donate double the number or double the density of red blood cells. So what they use is they use a special machine that essentially spins the whole blood out and separates the red blood cells from the rest of the blood components. And it returns the plasma, which is that liquid colored um, fluid, or sorry, that yellow colored fluid and the, and the platelets and things like that back to your body. Now, because they're taking out double the red cells, even though they're returning most of the blood volume, you can only donate power red every 16 weeks. So twice as, as frequently as a whole blood donation. And then there's other types of, um, non-standard donations. So you can do just a platelet donation. So platelets, as I mentioned, participate in blood clotting. Um, and a lot of people who have clotting disorders like hemophilia and cancer patients, um, you know, often need routine donations of platelets. And so all they do is they centrifuge out the platelets from the whole blood and they return everything else, uh, the plasma, the red cells, etc., back to you. Um, one platelet donation is usually up to five um, whole blood donations worth of platelets. And you can donate platelets every seven days because platelets regenerate very quickly and they're not transporting oxygen or things like that. So there's no concern really about donating too often. Um, and then the last one is AB plasma. So plasma, as I mentioned, is that that liquid that has um, proteins and, and most of the liquid volume of your blood. And this is someone who is AB blood type, um, and they can donate to anyone um, plasma. And this is really important because it's basically giving blood volume back. And this is really important to people who are trauma patients, people who have internal bleeding, where they're um, hypovolemic, meaning their blood volume is too low and their blood pressure is crashing. So this is returning fluid to their body um, to help stabilize them. And so you can donate plasma every every 28 days. Um, so lots of different options to donate and it's, it's always great. Um, everybody needs different types of blood donations throughout their life. Um, and you know, if you're able to donate, it's always a wonderful thing to do. So I, I have three things to say. One is last year, the Red Cross, they actually said there was a major shortage of blood, yeah. um, you know, amidst COVID, people are not going, we're not going out as much and, you know, doing these non-essential things like donate blood. Right. And so this really is a big issue. And, and so if you are um, able to, definitely, definitely go ahead. I mean, it's, it's literally life-saving. We've done posts on blood donation and other things things like organ donation. So definitely check out our searchable database. Um, two, Andrea, do you happen to know your blood type? Yeah, I'm O positive. So am I. <laughs> I love that. Wait, wait, universal do, donor is O negative, right? O negative because they're RH yeah. negative. Um, right. RH negative. But O positive is still always in high demand. Um, so you can donate to anybody who's also RH positive, um, yeah. which is, you know, a large proportion of the population. And O is the universal blood type, meaning we have no... Um, antigens on our blood cells um and so it doesn't cross react and i do try and donate as often as i can so love that and third um shout out to whoever it is uh who submitted this question for saying beer and not just like <laughs> you know urine or apple juice or apple cider like we are we are right there we are on the same page all right next question i think the next question has to do with poop if i'm Obviously, not mistaken and yeah. people love poop talk love so poop. let's get into it um this question was submitted by hillary who asks are the stools people use in their bathroom really necessary basically the potty. is there a correct way to have a bowel movement the squatty potty i'm not gonna lie so i have a squatty potty do you have a squatty potty i don't but i also don't have kids so like i feel like the okay. squatty potty is kind of like born out of like you know kids needing a little bit like you know a stool to get their feet resting on something so their mm. legs aren't hanging. Um, I have contemplated it, especially with all of my bowel-related issues. <laughs> Well, so I was going to say, and this this might be TMI, but when have when has that ever stopped us? So, you know, uh, Ethan is in here and he, he always yells at me because I really, I don't drink enough water. And this is something that I have to be better about. Hydration is key. We know this. And so sometimes I get a little constipated. And I have honestly found that the Squatty Potty just 
helps me go. Don't know if it's placebo or not, although I'll get into some research no, it, that shows it that it's can. a real thing. Yeah. So the, the answer to the question is, is it necessary? No, it's not necessary, but it, it can help. There's definitely truth to it. Um, so let's see here. So I, I wrote a little pun here in the little outline that I just want to share. So they oh. typically, there, there are different types. You know, some people call them um, poop, school, poop stools, potty stools. So if you have a, a what did I say? If you struggle with your stool, pun intended, they might be a good investment. So, all right. So there are really three primary positions that humans use to poop. And in medical literature, they're referred to as defecation postures. So they're sitting, they're sitting with hips flexed, and then they're squatting. And so um, to help you envision the way that our body empties our bowels, you can picture a flexible pipe as the exit canal from our body, and the pipe is our rectal canal. And so if the pipe is compressed or bent, right. it's harder to empty that the, the chamber above it, right? And so when the pipe is straight, it forms a more direct route um, that allows, you know, poop to exit our body. So um, hip flexion is the degree to which our legs are elevated or tilted during a bowel movement. And that can help, and there is some research to support this, it can help the rectal canal reach its potential as an evacuation route. So sitting is the position that modern day toilets, you know, allow yeah. for. Um, it's it's like the a, posture. It's your it's your ninety degree. It's your ninety degree, right? Right, right. It's yeah. what's exactly. It's what's your, most your common. Your feet are on the ground. You're sitting at a ninety degree angle. Right. So it's what's most commonly used in the Western Hemisphere using a traditional pedestal type um, toilet bowl. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the pedestal toilet came into prevalence in the 19th century when indoor plumbing became more mainstream. Now, there's some research that has traced certain conditions such as IBS and chronic constipation to this type of toileting position. And, you know, the, the natural human impulse is actually to squat when emptying the bowels. And so then I'm the gonna, sitting I'm position gonna, doesn't gonna, allow for that. I'm going to use my yeah. fingers. So, so this is you mm, sitting on That's what she table. said. Where I, I probably have like a little plastic toilet somewhere. Um, this is you sitting on the toilet, and this is you if you have a squatty potty, which raises your feet up so it bends your knees more, and now you have a sharper angle, right? Right. Mm hmm. Right, exactly. Thank you for the visual. You're so good at the visuals. Um, and so sitting with hips flexed, sitting on the toilet with your hips flexed away from your body at a 60 degree angle helps the rectal muscles move into a more neutral position, reducing the strain that it takes to get your poop out. Um, and can I so, just, can I just yeah. chime in? So when you're going to the bathroom, you have two sets of anal sphincter muscles you have the ones that you physically contract the you know when you're going to the bathroom or when you're trying to hold in um you know poop when you don't want to don't want to poop but then you have um you have your internal sphincter muscles which are you know unconsciously regulated and so you know a lot of times adjusting the position allows those internal anal sphincter muscles to relax which you can't even really feel because it's completely unconscious it's done you know by your autonomic nervous system so there have been a couple of studies that have looked into this type of you know feet elevation basically the the, the squatty potty and it has been shown to improve bowel um emptying um i'm looking of course right now my computer is freezing but i had let me see here so in 2019 there was a study although it did have a small sample size that sh sample size excuse me that showed that a toilet modification device that elevated the hip flexors into a squatting position re resulted in less straining and more complete bowel movements. Study participants also spent more time pooping when they use this type of device. And that's the other thing. Wait, sorry, what were you going to oh, say? I was going to say, you know, and then you have the 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 final extreme, which is something that we see in, um, you know, Eastern countries where you have the hole in the ground toilet right. where you're straight up squatting. Um, any of my fellow yoga practitioners, that would be your, your you know, your deep squat position. And, and that's a very, very sharp, you know, very sharp angle. Um, you know, and, and of course that is, you know, an alternative position. Um, I think one thing that's also really important is, you know, whatever position you're choosing to poop in, one of the biggest things is not sitting on the toilet for too long. Um, mm -hmm. because 
that can actually compress blood supply and it can lead to swollen veins and when those are in the, yeah and when those are in the <laughs> rectal area and they bulge and become varicose veins those um become hemorrhoids and um you know so ultimately you want to do what's best for your own bowels what feels the best what allows you to poop uh the most naturally yeah hemorrhoids are no fun um definitely highly recommend staying hydrated um and uh yeah as you said not sitting for too long in the toilet and and you know if you're frequently constipated maybe uh try out a squatty potty so yeah this this gets two thumbs up um all right andrea next question do you want to get into it yeah so i think this one is oh this is from aaron so her question is all about ticks so I'm gonna I'm gonna take that one so um, she says my daughter is literally a tick magnet I know DEET is safe on skin but is there such thing as using too much DEET she's the only one in her family that, that gets multiple tick bites a year and she has so much anxiety about Lyme disease if we don't spot them quickly enough um, so she said she sent her some of the the website information but wanted us to maybe um, dig into DEET a little bit more so we did do a post specifically on DEET but you know maybe I can kind of summarize so DEET, which is officially known as NN diethyl metatoluamide, is the active ingredient in DEET. That is the colloquial name for it. Um, and so this is one of the most effective insect repellents. It was developed decades ago and has decades of data demonstrating safety and efficacy. An alternative um, is also picaridin, which is also very effective. But a lot of the repellents that are marketed as being like all natural or like lemon oil, eucalyptus oil, they actually don't have a lot of efficacy data for ticks and also things like mosquitoes. So really, I recommend sticking with DEET and sticking with picaridin. The nice thing with DEET is that it is safe for almost everyone, to, anyone two months and older, um, pregnant women, um, really almost everyone can use DEET. Um, these uh, DEET containing repellents are really the most effective against repelling tick bites and DEET would be applied directly to the skin. So it doesn't actually kill an insect or a biting insect like a mosquito or a tick. It actually, it essentially blocks the scent that we secrete. And so the insect doesn't recognize that this is a, an animal that it can bite and feed on. So it does wear off over a period of time. So there are DEET concentration ranges of anywhere from 4% DEET to 100% DEET. And let me tell you, when I was in South America, I was using 100% DEET because I didn't want no yellow fever or dengue or chikungunya or Zika. So, and that was for the mosquitoes, not for the ticks. But um, the concentration of DEET in, in a formulation, whether it's a spray or a lotion or a wipe, um, all of these things are certainly effective. Um, that's really an indication of how long you can wear it before reapplication. So the higher the concentration of DEET, the longer it will be effective at repelling a given insect species. So for example, and this is actually the recommendation for tick repellents, you want a 20 to 30% DEET concentration. And for ticks, that's going to be effective for about six to eight hours. After that, or if you're really sweaty, you want to reapply more frequently, kind of like sunscreen. Um, for children under 10, it's a 10% DEET recommendation um, because they may have more um, potential irritant irritation on their skin. But 10% DEET only provides two hours of protection. So if you're going with a 10% DEET for your kids, you need to reapply more frequently. Now, the good thing is whether you're going 4% DEET or 100% DEET, there is no evidence that using DEET topically on your skin is harmful. Again, we have decades of data that demonstrate that it is safe and, and safe for all of these populations to use. For kids under 10, parents, you want to apply it to them because you don't want to ingest, inhale, or get it in um, your mucous membranes, particularly your eyes, because it can be an irritant and it can be... Um, can be toxic if ingested. So you wanna to apply it topically, let it dry. Um, also, as I mentioned, safe for pregnancy, safe for kids two months and older. As with almost everything, there are situations that there can be rare adverse events. Um, these are typically with really high exposure, usually involving um, um, inhalation or ingestion of aerosolized DEET sprays. And that can include some scary sounding symptoms like um, lack of coordination, um, agitation, aggression, sometimes 
really, really rare seizures, um, low a drop in blood pressure, and sometimes skin irritation. But again, if you're using it as directed, it doesn't really matter the concentration you're working with. It is safe for use on your skin. Um, and I do want to just maybe assuage Aaron's concerns about Lyme disease since I did grow up just adjacent to Lyme, Connecticut. I studied Lyme disease. I've lived in the epicenter of Lyme my entire life in New England, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, I used to collect ticks by dragging sheets out in grassy fields and picking the ticks off the sheets. Um, I have never gotten Lyme disease. Yes, it is out there. But if you are very vigilant about tick repellents and using um, insecticides on your clothing and also doing these prompt tick checks, the risk is very, very low. It's not zero, but it's very, very low and it's treatable. I would say best thing to do is always couple a tick check whenever you get in from outside and check in those those um, cozy places behind the ears, in the armpit, in the belly button, in the groin areas, the butt crack, butt the crack, tick, butt <laughs> crack. Um, in between the toes, the ticks, they they climb on you from the ground. They don't drop out of trees. That's another myth. And they climb up your body and they're looking for a place that's a nice little protected nook. They're not going to usually bite on like your forearm because that's going to get rubbed off really easily. So they're looking for somewhere they can tuck themselves in and stay away and and have their meal, which is all they're looking for. So a few things. One, Andrea failed to mention that she's the executive director of the American Lyme Disease Foundation. So she is an authority on this subject matter. Um, also, DEET is not the same thing as DDT. People oh, often yeah. get those things confused. Yeah. And we not do have a post. Yeah. Not at all. There's no relationship whatsoever. Nope. Um, and actually, Andrea, today I pulled a tick off of Maccabee and off of myself. It was crawling. So um you right toward my toes and at this point like I used to be like Ugh! but now I just kind of pick it up and actually I flush these down the toilet <laughs> excuse me but they did not attach so I didn't have to do my little freak out where I bug you um <laughs> the other thing that you told me that I thought was really helpful is you can also I know this particular question was about DEET but you could also treat your clothes and you yes. recommended that I what was it permeth uh permeth 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 yes permeth and that is not for skin application, Correct. but you could treat your clothes and that also helps prevent Correct. tick Correct. bites and all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, okay. and permethrin is actually an insecticide, so it will kill insects that um, okay. it enca you know that encounter it as opposed to DEET, which is a repellent. So a multi-pronged approach is always your best approach. Also other things like wearing light colored pants in the woods, so you can see things more easily, tucking your pants into your socks, wearing high socks, you know, all these sorts of things are always going to improve your ability to find ticks and remove them even before they bite you. Um, but even if they do bite you, as long as you're pulling them off within 24 hours, you know, there's very low risk of anything related to Lyme disease. All right, Andrea, do we want to answer one more question before we wrap yeah. up? Yeah, why not? Okay, so this question, I think you're you're best suited to answer this as an immunologist. So this came from an anonymous um, submitter, and the question is: A coworker claims one teaspoon of sugar depresses the immune system for five hours. This can't be true, right? You are correct. It is not true. Um, the TLDR is no. So so maybe I'll just cover a little bit of, of science. And again, this is all this. There's some sort of weird nugget of truth, and then it's been co-opted and, and fear-mongered. So one teaspoon of sugar, just for everyone to know, table sugar, we're talking about granulated sugar, is four grams of weight and of mass and of carbohydrates. Um, there are a lot of studies out there that talk about the uh, implications of chronic overconsumption of sugar, and that's something that we've talked about. Sugar in and of itself is not harmful. We need carbohydrates for survival. We utilize them to make the building blocks of energy in our body, and it is our preferred energy source. It's most easily metabolized by our body. There have been some studies that have come out in certain journals. There was a nutrition study that was looking at, and they were claiming that um, – you know, overconsumption or excessive consumption of sugar can suppress the immune system or, or um, lead to a dampening of the reactivity of certain immune cell populations. And yeah, theoretically, this could be true, but we're talking about, you know, 75 to 100 grams of sugar, not a teaspoon of sugar and not at a single time. We're talking about chronic overconsumption. And it has a lot less to do with suppressing the immune system, but rather leading to 
comorbidities and other chronic illnesses like metabolic dysregulation and type 2 diabetes and things like that, which are not solely due to sugar itself. Again, it's rather overconsumption of different things, sedentary lifestyle, et cetera. So we've talked a lot about how to maintain a healthy immune system. And one of the biggest things there is eating a broad and diverse diet, high in fiber, um, you know, lots of plant-based proteins, lean meats, um, you know, a lot of those things are also going to have carbohydrates, right? Fruit is full of sugar. You know, sugar is not bad. Um, also getting vaccines, doing um, routine exercise. It can be very moderate exercise, good sleep hygiene. These are all the things that help your immune system function. Um, but if you're putting a teaspoon of sugar in your morning coffee, you do not need to freak out. Two other quick things. Uh, sugar also does not feed cancer, which is yes. something that we've debunked on our page. And also this glamorization of honey and maple syrup as being superior or better than sugar is also not accurate. And we Correct. have a post on that as well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so we, don't need, we don't need to villainize sugar. Sugar yeah. is just a molecule and actually sugar is a catch-all use for a lot of different carbohydrate molecules. Um, but in the context of table sugar, we're talking about sucrose. Again, sucrose, not harmful. All of these other healthy sugar alternatives like honey and agave and maple syrup and et cetera, all, and, and cane sugar and raw sugar and brown sugar. And they Coconut all have, sugar. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> so let's, let's stop villainizing sugar. And if you want to have a teaspoon of sugar in your coffee or whatever you're putting a teaspoon of sugar in, um, you know, just everything in moderation, I think, is is my big, my mantra. Um, Andrea, have you cashed your big sugar check? Because you know <laughs> that's going to be what we're oh, yeah. what we're I being accused of. Have some uh, some Reese's pieces for later. <laughs> oh my god, I can't. The fact that you say pieces that we have Reese's, to that's a whole Reese's pieces. <laughs> Reese's pieces. No, it's not pieces. You in Montana, you say it this way. Anyways, well, we hope that oh my, we hope you learned a thing or two. I'm using your line. No, we hope you enjoyed this. Honestly, this is fun. It's yeah. a little bit more playful than our podcast episodes. We get to, you know, interface with, with you all. So again, if you would like to submit a question, um, definitely be sure to subscribe to our Substack. Andrea, how can they do it that? It is <laughs> theunbiasedsipod.substack.com and it's only $5 a month. So if you want to yes. submit your questions, join our private Facebook group, um, participate in, in our, and I think there's also like merchandise discounts. Yes. Got, like, yes. Fun stickers and t-shirts. And we, we don't, we don't sell a lot of those, but it's always nice when someone sends us no. a picture of them repping the pod. So honestly, I think that, that, that we're not like really profiting off it, maybe like a dollar or something. <laughs> and again, that goes towards operational costs, but it's more just awesome that people yeah, support got, us um, and support science. I've got some of our stickers on my phone case. So correlation is not causation and, and the pod. Oh, there you go. Yeah. This is my yeah. new phone. Ooh. I haven't finished decorating yet. <laughs> love that. Love that. Yeah, I actually have to replace this one's rubbing off a little bit. But it's super cool. It, it yeah, makes us really happy. Thank you. Thank you, Subsex subscribers. And we will see you next time. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>